Rare Possibilities by E.M. Bounds. The following is from Chapter 4, 5 and 6 of E.M. Bounds' book The Possibilities of Prayer. Chapter 4 Prayer Its Possibilities. How vast are the possibilities of prayer? How wide is its reach? What great things are accomplished by this divinely appointed means of grace? It lays its hand on Almighty God and moves him to do what he would not otherwise do if prayer was not offered. It brings things to pass which would never otherwise occur. The story of prayer is the story of great achievements. Prayer is a wonderful power placed by Almighty God in the hands of his saints which may be used to accomplish great purposes and to achieve unusual results. Prayer reaches to everything, takes in all things great and small which are promised by God to the children of men. The only limit to prayer are the promises of God and his ability to fulfill those promises. Open thy mouth wide and I will fill it. The records of prayer's achievements are encouraging to faith, cheering to the expectations of saints, and is an inspiration to all who would pray and test its value. Prayer is no mere untried theory. It is not some strange unique scheme, concocted in the brains of men, and set on foot by them, an invention which has never been tried nor put to the test. Prayer is a divine arrangement in the moral government of God, designed for the benefit of men and intended as a means for furthering the interests of his cause on earth, and carrying out his gracious purposes in redemption and providence. Prayer proves itself. It is susceptible of proving its virtue by those who pray. Prayer needs no proof other than its accomplishments. If any man will do his will, he shall know the doctrine. If any man will know the virtue of prayer, if he will know what it will do, let him pray. Let him put prayer to the test. What a breath is given to prayer? What heights it reaches? It is the breathing of the soul, inflamed for God, and inflamed for man. It goes as far as the gospel goes, and is as wide, compassionate, and prayerful as is that gospel. How much of prayer do all these unpossessed, alienated provinces of earth demand to enlighten them, to impress them and to move them toward God and His Son, Jesus Christ? Had the professed disciples of Christ only have prayed in the past as they ought to have done, the centuries would not have found these provinces still bound in death, in sin, and in ignorance. Alas! How the unbelief of men has limited the power of God to work through prayer! What limitations have disciples of Jesus Christ put upon prayer by their prayerlessness? How the church, with her neglect of prayer, has hedged about the gospel and shut up doors of access. Prayer possibilities open doors for the entrance of the gospel, while praying also for us that God would open to us a door of utterance. Prayer opened for the apostles doors of utterance, created opportunities and made openings to preach the gospel. The appeal by prayer was to God, because God was moved by prayer. God was there by moved to do his own work, in an enlarged way and by new ways. Prayer possibility gives not only great power and opens doors to the gospel, but it gives facility as well to the gospel. Prayer makes the gospel to go fast and to move with glorious swiftness. A gospel, rejected by the mighty energies of prayer, is neither slow, lazy nor dull. It moves with God's power, with God's radiance and with angelic swiftness. Brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have recourse and be glorified, is the request of the Apostle Paul, whose faith reached to the possibilities of prayer for the preached word. The gospel moves altogether too slowly, often timidly, idly, and with feeble steps. What will make this gospel go rapidly like a race runner? What will give this gospel divine radiance and glory and cause it to move worthy of God and of Christ? The answer is at hand. Prayer, more prayer, better prayer, will do the deed. This means of grace will give fast-going, splendor, and divinity to the gospel. The possibilities of prayer reach to all things. Whatever concerns man's highest welfare and whatever has to do with God's plans and purposes concerning men on earth is a subject for prayer. In whatsoever ye shall ask is embraced all that concerns us or the children of men and God. And whatever is left out of whatsoever is left out of prayer. Where will we draw the lines which leave out or which will limit the word whatsoever? Define it and search out and publish the things which the word does not include. If whatsoever does not include all things then add to it the word anything. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. What riches of grace, what blessings, spiritual and temporal, what good, for time and eternity, would have been ours had we learned the possibilities of prayer and our faith, had taken in the wide range of the divine promises to us to answer prayer. What blessings on our times and what furtherance to God's cause had we but learn how to pray with large expectations. Who will rise up in this generation and teach the church this lesson? It is a child's lesson in simplicity, but who has learned it well enough to put prayer to the test? It is a great lesson in its matchless and universal good. The possibilities of prayer are unspeakable, but the lesson of prayer which realizes and measures up to these possibilities who has learned. In his discourse in John 15, our Lord seems to connect friendship for him with prayer, and his choosing of his disciples seemed to have been with a design that through prayer they should bear much fruit. 
Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you, that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Here we have again the undefined and unlimited word, whatsoever, as covering the rights and the things for which we are to pray in the possibilities of prayer. We have still another declaration from Jesus, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. The third one ye have asked nothing in my name, ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. Here is a very definite exhortation from our Lord to largeness in praying. Here we are definitely urged by him to ask for large things, and announced with a dignity and solemnity indicated by the devil amen, verily, verily. Why these marvelous urgencies in this last recorded and vital conversation of our Lord with his disciples? The answer is that our Lord might prepare them for the new dispensation in which prayer was to have such marvelous results and in which prayer was to be the chief agency to conserve and make aggressive his gospel. In our Lord's language to his disciples about choosing them that should bear fruit, he clearly teaches us that this matter of praying and fruit bearing is not a petty business of our choice or secondary matter in relation to other matters, but that he has chosen us for this very business of praying. He has specially in mind our praying, and he has chosen us of his own divine selection, and he expects us to do this one thing of praying and to do it intelligently and well. For he before says that he had made us his friends, and had brought us into bosom confidence with him, and also into free and full conference with him. The main object of choosing us as his disciples in a friendship for him was that we might be the better fitted to bear the fruit of prayer. Let us not forget that we are noting the possibilities of the true praying ones. Anything is the word of very young circumference. How far it reaches we may not know. How wide it spreads, our minds fail to discover. What is there which is not within its reach? Why does Jesus repeat and exhaust these words, all inclusive and boundless words, if he does not desire to emphasize the unbounded magnificence and illimitable munificence of prayer? Why does he press men to pray, so that our very poverty might be enriched and our limitless inheritance by prayer be secured? We affirm, with absolute certainty, that Almighty God answers prayer. The vast possibilities and the urgent necessity of prayer lie in this stupendous fact that God hears and answers prayer. And God hears and answers all prayer. He hears and answers every prayer where the true conditions of praying are met. Either this is so or it is not. If not, then is there nothing in prayer? Then prayer is but the recitation of words, a mere verbal performance, an empty ceremony. Then prayer is an altogether useless exercise. But if what we have said is true, then are there vast possibilities in prayer? Then is it far-reaching in its scope and wide in its range? Then is it true that prayer can lay its hand upon Almighty God and move Him to do great and wonderful things? The benefits, the possibilities and the necessity of prayer are not merely subjective but are peculiarly objective in their character. Prayer aims at a definite object. Prayer has a direct design in view. Prayer always has something specific before the mind's eye. There may be some subjective benefits which accrue from praying, but this is altogether secondary and incidental. Prayer always drives directly at an object and seeks to secure a desired end. Prayer is asking, seeking and knocking at a door for something we have not, which we desire, and which God has promised to us. Prayer is a direct address to God. In everything let your requests be made known unto God. Prayer secures blessings and makes men better because it reaches the ear of God. Prayer is only for the betterment of men when it has affected God and moved him to do something for men. Prayer affects men by affecting God. Prayer moves men because it moves God to move men. Prayer influences men by influencing God to influence them. Prayer moves the hand that moves the world. That power is prayer which soars on high through Jesus to the throne and moves the hand which moves the world to bring salvation down. The utmost possibilities of prayer have rarely been realized. The promises of God are so great to those who truly pray when he puts himself so fully into the hands of the praying ones that it almost staggers our faith and causes us to hesitate with astonishment. His promise to answer and to do and to give all things, anything, whatsoever, and all things whatsoever, is so large, so great, so exceeding broad that we stand back in amazement and give ourselves to questioning and doubt. We stagger at the promises through unbelief. Really the answers of God to prayer have been pared down by us to our little faith and have been brought down to the low level of our narrow notions about God's ability, liberality, and resources. Let us ever keep in mind and never for one moment allow ourselves to doubt the statement that God means what he says in all of his promises. God's promises are his own word. His veracity is at stake in them. To question them is to doubt his veracity. He cannot afford to prove faithless to his word. In hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. 
His promises are for plain people, and he means to do for all who pray just what he says he will do. For he is faithful that hath promised. Unfortunately we have failed to lay ourselves out in praying. We have limited the Holy One of Israel. The ability to pray can be secured by the grace and power of the Holy Spirit, but it demands so strenuous and high character that it is a rare thing for a man or woman to be on praying ground and on pleading terms with God. It is as true today as it was in the days of Elijah that the fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. How much such a prayer avails, who can tell? The possibilities of prayer are the possibilities of faith. Prayer and faith are Siamese twins. One heart animates them both. Faith is always praying. Prayer is always believing. Faith must have a tongue by which it can speak. Prayer is the tongue of faith. Faith must receive. Prayer is the hand of faith stretched out to receive. Prayer must rise and soar. Faith must give prayer the wings to fly and soar. Prayer must have an audience with God. Faith opens the door and access an audience are given. Prayer asks. Faith lays its hand on the thing asked for. God's omnipotent power is the basis of omnipotent faith and omnipotent praying. All things are possible to him that believeth, and all things whatsoever are given to him who prays. God's decree and death yield readily to Hezekiah's faith and prayer. When God's promise and man's praying are united by faith, then nothing shall be impossible. Importunate prayer is so all-powerful and irresistible that it obtains promises or wins where the prospect and the promise seem to be against it. In fact, the New Testament promise includes all things in heaven and in earth. God, I promise, puts all things he possesses into man's hands. Prayer and faith put man in possession of this boundless inheritance. Prayer is not an indifferent or a small thing. It is not a sweet little privilege. It is a great prerogative, far-reaching in its effects. Failure to pray entails losses far beyond the person who neglects it. Prayer is not a mere episode of the Christian life. Rather the whole life is a preparation for and the result of prayer. In its condition, prayer is the sum of religion. Faith is but a channel of prayer. Faith gives it wings and swiftness. Prayer is the lungs through which holiness breathes. Prayer is not only the language of spiritual life, but also makes its very essence and forms its real character. O oh, for faith that will not shrink, though pressed by every foe that will not tremble on the brink of any earthly woe. Lord, give us such a faith as this, and then, whither may come, we'll taste in here the hallowed bliss of our eternal home. Chapter 5 Prayer Its Possibilities Continued After a comprehensive and cursory view of the possibilities of prayer as mapped out in what has been said, it is important to descend to particulars, to Bible facts and principles in regard to this great subject. What are the possibilities of prayer as disclosed by divine revelation? The necessity of prayer and its being are coexistent with man. Nature, even before a clear and full revelation, cries out in prayer. Man is, therefore prayer is. God is, therefore prayer is. Prayer is born of the instincts, the needs and the cravings and the very being of man. The prayer of Solomon at the dedication of the temple is the product of inspired wisdom and piety and gives a lucid and powerful view of prayer in the wideness of its range, the minuteness of its details, and its surrounding possibilities and its urgent necessity. How minute and exactly comprehending is this prayer? National and individual blessings are in it, and temporal and spiritual good is embraced by it. Individual sins, national calamities, sins, sickness, exile, famine, war, pestilence, mildew, drought, insects, damage to crops, whatever affects husbandry, enemies whatsoever sickness, one's own sore, one's own guilt, one's own sin, one and all are in this prayer, and all are for prayer. For all these evils prayer is the one universal remedy. Pure praying remedies all ills, cures all diseases, relieves all situations, however dire, calamitous, fearful, and despairing. Prayer to God, pure praying, relieves dire situations, because God can relieve when no one else can. Nothing is too hard for God. No cause is hopeless which God undertakes. No case is mortal when Almighty God is the physician. No conditions are despairing which can deter or defy God. Almighty God heard this prayer of Solomon and committed himself to undertake, to relieve and to remedy if real praying be done, despite all adverse and inexorable conditions. He will always relieve, answer and bless, if men will pray, from the heart, and if they will give themselves to real, true praying. This is the record of what God said to him after Solomon had finished his magnificent, illimitable and all-comprehending prayer, and the Lord appeared to Solomon by night, and said to him, I have heard thy prayer, and have chosen this place for myself for a house of sacrifice.
If I shut up him, that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts, that they devour the land, or if I send pestilence among the people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Now my eyes shall be open, and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house, that my name may be there forever. God put no limitation to his ability to save through true praying. No hopeless conditions, no accumulation of difficulties, and no desperation in distance or circumstance can hinder the success of real prayer. The possibilities of prayer are linked to the infinite integrity and omnipotent power of God. There is nothing too hard for God to do. God is pledged that if we ask, we shall receive. God can withhold nothing from faith and prayer. The thing surpasses all my thought, but faithful is my Lord, through unbelief I stagger not, for God hath spoke the word. Faith, mighty faith, the promise sees, and looks to that alone, laughs at impossibilities, and cries, It shall be done. The many statements of God's word fully set forth the possibilities and far-reaching nature of prayer. How full of pathos! Call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Again, read the cheering words, He shall call upon me, and I will answer him, I will be with him in trouble, I will deliver him and honor him. How diversified the range of trouble! How almost infinite its extent! How universal and dire its conditions! How despairing its ways! Yet the range of prayer is as great as trouble, is as universal as sorrow, as infinite as grief. And prayer can relieve all these evils which come to the children of men. There is no tear which prayer cannot wipe away or dry up. There is no depression of spirits which it cannot relieve and elevate. There is no despair which it cannot dispel. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great things and difficult which thou knowest not. How broad these words of the Lord, how great the promise, how cheering to faith! They really challenge the faith of the saint. Prayer always brings God to our relief to bless and to aid, and brings marvelous revelations of his power. What impossibilities are there with God? Name them. Nothing, he says, is impossible to the Lord. And all the possibilities in God are in prayer. Samuel, under the judges of Israel, will fully illustrate the possibility and the necessity of prayer. He himself was the beneficiary of the greatness of faith and prayer in a mother who knew what praying meant. Hannah, his mother, was a woman of mark, in character and in piety, who was childless. That privation was a source of worry and weakness and grief. She sought God for relief and prayed and poured out her soul before the Lord. She continued her praying, in fact she multiplied her praying, to such an extent that the old Eli she seemed to be intoxicated, almost beside herself in the intensity of her supplications. She was specific in her prayers. She wanted a child. For a man-child she prayed. And God was specific in his answer. A man-child God gave her, a man indeed he became. He was the creation of prayer, and grew himself to a man of prayer. He was a mighty intercessor, especially in emergencies in the history of God's people. The epitome of his life and character is found in the statement, Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel, and the Lord heard him. The victory was complete, and the Ebenezer was the memorial of the possibilities and necessity of prayer. Again, at another time, Samuel called to the Lord, and thunder and rain came out of season in wheat harvest. Here are some statements concerning this mighty intercessor, who knew how to pray, and whom God always regarded when he prayed. Samuel cried unto the Lord all night. Says he at another time, in speaking to the Lord's people, Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. These great occasions show how this notable ruler of Israel made prayer a habit, and that this was a notable and conspicuous characteristic of his dispensation. Prayer was no strange exercise to Samuel. He was accustomed to it. He was in the habit of praying, knew the way to God, and received answers from God. Through Samuel and his praying God's cause was brought out of its slow, depressed condition, and a great national revival began, of which David was one of its fruits. Samuel was one of the notable men of the old dispensation who stood out prominently as one who had great influence with God in prayer. God could not deny Samuel anything he asked of God. Samuel's praying always affected God and moved God to do what would not have otherwise been done had Samuel not prayed. Samuel stands out as a striking illustration of the possibilities of prayer. He shows conclusively the achievements of prayer. Jacob is an illustration for all time of the commanding and conquering forces of prayer. God came to him as an antagonist. He grappled Jacob and shook him as if he were in the embrace of a deadly foe. Jacob, the deceitful supplanter, the wily, unscrupulous traitor, had no eyes to see God. His perverted principles and his deliberate overreaching and wrongdoing had blinded his vision. To reach God, to know God, and to conquer God was the demand of this critical hour. 
Jacob was alone, an all-night witness to the intensity of the struggle, its changing issues, and its veering fortunes, as well as the receding and advancing lines in the conflict. Here was the strength of weakness, the power of self-despair, the energy of perseverance, the elevation of humility, and the victory of surrender. Jacob's salvation issued from the forces which he massed in that all-night conflict. He prayed and wept and importuned until the fiery hate of Ezra's heart died and it was softened into love. A greater miracle was wrought on Jacob than on Ezra. His name, his character, and his destiny were changed by that all-night praying. Here is the record of the results of that night's praying struggle, as a prince has thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. By his strength he had power with God, ye, he had power over the angel and prevailed. What forces lie in importunate prayer? What mighty results are gained by it in one night's struggle in praying? God is affected and changed in attitude, and two men are transformed in character and destiny. Chapter 6 Prayer Its Possibilities Continued The possibilities of prayer are seen in its results in temporal matters. Prayer reaches to everything which concerns man, whether it be his body, his mind, or his soul. Prayer embraces the very smallest things of life. Prayer takes in the wants of the body, food, raiment, business, finances, in fact everything which belongs to this life, as well as those things which have to do with the eternal interests of the soul. Its achievements are seen not only in the large things of earth, but more especially in what might be called the little things of life. It brings to pass not only large things, speaking after the manner of men, but also the small things. Temporal matters are of a lower order than the spiritual, but they concern us greatly. Our temporal interests make up a great part of our lives. They are the main source of our cares and worries. They have much to do with our religion. We have bodies with wants, pains, disabilities, and limitations. That which concerns our bodies necessarily engages our minds. These are subjects of prayer, and prayer takes in all of them, and large are the accomplishments of prayer in this realm of our being. Our temporal matters have much to do with our health and happiness. They form our relations. They are tests of honesty and belong to the sphere of justice and righteousness. Not to pray about temporal matters is to leave God out of the largest sphere of our being. He who cannot pray in everything as we are charged to do by Paul in Philippians, 4th chapter, has never learned in any true sense the nature and worth of prayer. To leave business and time out of prayer is to leave religion and eternity out of it. He who does not pray about temporal matters cannot pray with confidence about spiritual matters. He who does not put God by prayer in his struggling toil for daily bread will never put him in his struggle for him. He who does not cover and supply the wants of the body by prayer will never cover and supply the wants of his soul. Both body and soul are dependent on God and prayer is but the crying expression of that dependence. The Seraphonician woman prayed for the health things. In fact the Old Testament is but the record of God in dealing with his people through the divine appointment of prayer. Abraham prayed that Sodom might be saved from destruction. Abraham's servant prayed and received God's direction in choosing a wife for Isaac. Hannah prayed and Samuel was given to her. Elijah prayed and no rain came for three years. And he prayed again and the clouds gave rain. Hezekiah was saved from a mortal sickness by his praying. Jacob's praying saved him from Ezra's revenge. The Old Bible is the history of prayer for temporal blessings as well as for spiritual blessings. In the New Testament we have the same principles illustrated and enforced. Prayer in this section of God's Word covers the whole realm of good, both temporal and spiritual. Our Lord, in His universal prayer, the prayer for humanity, in every clime, in every age and for every condition, puts in it the petition, Give us this day our daily bread. This embraces all necessary earthly good. In the Sermon on the Mount, a whole paragraph is taken up by our Lord about food and raiment, where He is cautioning against undue care or anxiety for these things, and at the same time encouraging a faith which takes in and claims all these necessary bodily comforts and necessities. And this teaching stands in close connection with His teachings about prayer. Food and raiment are taught as subjects of prayer. Not for one moment is it even hinted that they are things beneath the notice of a great God, nor too material and earthly for such a spiritual exercise as prayer. The Seraphonician woman prayed for the health of her daughter. Peter prayed for Dorcas to be brought back to life. Paul prayed for the father of Publius on his way to Rome when cast on the island by a shipwreck, and God healed the man who was sick with a fever. He urged the Christians at Rome to strive with him together in prayer that he might be delivered from dead men. When Peter was put in prison by Herod, the church was instant in prayer that Peter might be delivered from the prison, and God honored the praying of these early Christians. John prayed that Gaius might prosper and be in health, even as his soul prospered. The divine directory in James, 5th chapter, says, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him.
Paul, in writing to the Philippians, fourth chapter, says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. This provides for all kinds of cares, business cares, home cares, body cares, and soul cares. All are to be brought to God by prayer, and at the mercy seat our minds and souls are to be unburdened of all that affects us or causes anxiety or uneasiness. These words of Paul stand in close connection with what he says about temporal matters specially, but now I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect to want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. And Paul closes his epistle to these Christians with words which embrace all temporal needs as well as spiritual wants, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory, by Christ Jesus. Unbelief in the doctrine that prayer covers all things which have to do with body and business affairs, breeds undue anxiety about earth's affairs, causes unnecessary worry, and creates very unhappy states of mind. How much needless care we would save ourselves if we but believed in prayer as a means of relieving those cares, and would learn the happy art of casting all our cares in prayer upon God. Who cares for us? Unbelief in God as one who is concerned about even the smallest affairs, which affect our happiness and comfort limits the Holy One of Israel, and makes our lives altogether devoid of real happiness and sweet contentment. We have in the instance of the failure of the disciples to cast the devil out of the lunatic son, brought to them by his father, while Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, a suggestive lesson of the union of faith, prayer, and fasting, and the failure to reach the possibilities and obligations of an occasion. The disciples ought to have cast the devil out of the boy. They had been sent out to do this very work, and had been empowered by the Lord and Master to do it. And yet they signally failed. Christ reproved them with sharp upbraidings for not doing it. They had been sent out on this very specific mission. This one thing was specified by our Lord when he sent them out. Their failure brought shame and confusion on them, and discounted their Lord and Master and his cause. They brought him into disrepute, and reflected very seriously upon the cause which they represented. Their faith to cast out the devil had signally failed, simply because it had not been nurtured by prayer and fasting. Failure to pray broke the ability of faith, and failure came because they had not the energy of a strong authoritative faith. The promise reads, and we cannot too often refer to it, for it is the very basis of our faith and the ground on which we stand when we pray, all things whatsoever ye ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. What enumeration table can tabulate, itemize, and aggregate, all things whatsoever? The possibilities of prayer and faith go to the length of the endless chain and cover the unmeasurable area. In Hebrews 11, the sacred penman, wearied with trying to specify the examples of faith and to recite the wonderful exploits of faith, pauses a moment and then cries out, giving us almost unheard of achievements of prayer and faith as exemplified by the saints of the olden times. Here is what he says, and what shall I say more? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, brought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness, were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. What an illustrious record is this! What marvelous accomplishments, brought not by armies, or by men's superhuman strength, nor by magic, but all accomplished simply by men and women noted alone for their faith and prayer. Hand in hand with these records of faith's illimitable range, are the illustrious records of prayer, for they are all one. Faith has never won a victory nor gained a crown, where prayer was not the weapon of the victory, and where prayer did not jewel the crown. If all things are possible to him that believeth, then all things are possible to him that prays. Depend on him, thou canst not fail, make all thy wants and wishes known. Fear not, his merits must prevail, ask but in faith, it shall be done.